How so? Hello. Thank you for joining us today to learn about our scoping study on Indigenous child welfare. Our scoping study addressed five research questions. This module is part two of two modules. Part one described the problem of disparities in Indigenous child welfare literature. Part two will explore the solutions that we found. You met our research team in the first module. Wendy Haight, David Gleesner, Scott Marsalis, and Carrie Wabanaskum, that's me, welcoming you to the module two. Our study addresses one of the most pressing issues facing child welfare policymakers and practitioners today, the dramatic overrepresentation of indigenous families in North American public child welfare systems. As we described in module one, Indigenous children experience high levels of disparities in the U.S. and Canadian child welfare systems. These disparities result from hundreds of years of government-sponsored genocide and continued oppression. Indigenous child welfare is a long emergency caused by sustained stress to Indigenous social, cultural, and ecological systems. Disparities persist despite the passage of the Indian Child Welfare Act in the U.S. in 1978. In Module 1, we examined reasons for persisting disparities in Indigenous child welfare that were present in the literature. In summary, these reasons include social challenges experienced by many child welfare involved families are more intense for Indigenous families. Appropriate services are even less available for child welfare involved Indigenous than other families. Racism presents challenges to available child welfare services. Racism in child welfare services can reinforce pre-existing distrust and disengagement and inadequate implementation of the Indian Child Welfare Act. We approached our study sensitized by writings and multiple conversations with Indigenous elders from Ojibwe tribes in Minnesota, including the Fond du Lac tribe. For decades, Indigenous elders and scholars have been practicing explicating and advocating for culturally based child welfare practices to improve services to struggling Indigenous families. We also approach this scoping study sensitized by concepts from developmental cultural psychology, specifically universalism without uniformity, certain human challenges such as caring for the young and elderly, family conflict and child maltreatment are common across cultural groups worldwide. The historical and cultural contexts of these common challenges, however, vary widely. For example, the historical trauma experienced by Indigenous peoples. Thus, how they are understood and approached is culturally nuanced, without uniformity. Understanding such cultural nuance is necessary to avoid homogenizing families from diverse cultural communities, including diverse Indigenous cultures. It is also critical to provide social services that make sense and are sustainable within diverse indigenous cultural communities. An understanding of universalism without uniformity is foundational for social workers to engage effectively with diverse client systems, including for non-indigenous social workers to implement culturally based services with indigenous communities. Through our study, we examined the current state of the published peer-reviewed empirical literature directly relevant to addressing the research questions or solutions. What are culturally based child protection beliefs, practices, and programs within Indigenous communities? What is the evidence regarding the effectiveness of culturally based child welfare programs? And what are the challenges to the widespread implementation of such culturally based programs? To quickly review our methodology, we primarily used the scoping review framework laid out by Arxi and O'Malley. A scoping study systematically reviews the literature, typically in a newly emerging or under-researched area of study. The purposes are to identify key concepts, the main sources and types of available evidence, and gaps in our understanding. We included empirical studies in peer-reviewed journals directly related to the involvement of Indigenous families in child welfare systems. We included studies of populations from the United States and Canada, including American Indian, Alaska Native, Inuit, Métis, and First Nations. We excluded methodological papers and dissertations.
I will introduce several key themes that we found in the literature based on our third question related to culturally based beliefs, practices, and programs. A number of empirical studies contain data relevant to understanding cultural beliefs and child protection practices within tribes. There is some evidence suggesting a need for unique policies and practices for indigenous people. For instance, in their analysis of the U.S. national foster care data for indigenous, African American, and Hispanic children, Lawler and colleagues found that an independent construct was operating for indigenous disparities. In this section, we turn to the cultural beliefs and practices within tribal communities for models of such policies and practices for reducing disparities and strengthening formal child welfare services to indigenous families. There is some evidence that within indigenous tribes and communities, children are viewed as embedded within extended families and tribes who are responsible for their care. In Halverson and colleagues' qualitative study of indigenous foster parents, participants considered the children within their care to be their kin, even if they were not biological relatives. These participants contextualized their caregiving within a cultural historical context involving the forced removal of indigenous children from their homes, especially during the boarding school era. They described the importance of socializing indigenous foster children through indigenous practices as part of healing from such historical trauma. Another characteristic of indigenous beliefs and child protection practices is a non-coercive strengths and community-based orientation to removing barriers to healthy functioning and healing from past traumas. Rousseau conducted a focus group with nine indigenous professionals and in-depth audio recorded interviews with 22 others working within the British Columbia Ministry of Children and Family Development. In contrast to North American government-run child welfare services, which typically focuses on diagnosing and treating family deficits and compelling behavioral change, indigenous professionals describe their management and practice as demonstrating strong collective values and a deep respect for community protocols. Rather than exerting expert authority and power, the orientation they described was one of sharing power with individuals and providing advocacy and support to remove barriers to healthy functioning. Our fourth question explored the evidence regarding the effectiveness of culturally based child welfare programs. Several studies contained empirical evidence regarding the effectiveness of culturally based or culturally sensitive programs. Indigenous scholars have been advocating for developing and implementing culturally based child welfare practices for decades. Some recent research includes empirical examinations of child welfare practices with Indigenous families that are culturally based or culturally adapted. We consider approaches that are culturally based at minimum to recognize the impact of historical context, including historical trauma on families. Consider children's extended families and tribes or communities as critical resources for their care and to be non-coercive strengths and community-based. Culturally adapted approaches emphasize cultural competence and sensitivity in the delivery of approaches originally designed for other contexts or apply approaches designed in other contexts that are based on culturally similar beliefs. Lucero and Bussey present an evaluation of a collaborative and trauma-informed practice model for urban indigenous child welfare. Established in 2000, the Denver Indian Family Resource Center is private, nonprofit, and community-based. As part of the Colorado Indian Child Welfare Act Task Force, it partners with child welfare systems in seven counties in the Denver metro area to reduce disparities and prevent the breakup of indigenous families. Its family preservation model was developed over a 10-year period as a practice model for indigenous families. The model incorporates components such as improving the cultural responsiveness of providers, encouraging partnerships, and otherwise supporting equal compliance. It also incorporates direct practice components, including team decision-making, intensive case management, and treatment services. In Iowa, Richardson evaluated a specialized Native American program within the Iowa Department of Human Services. The program focuses on community outreach, 
prevention and intervention with Indigenous children and families at risk of involvement in the child welfare system. It aims to improve cultural competence in the delivery of services, increase attention to Indian Child Welfare Act, reduce caseloads, increase available Indigenous foster homes, and place greater emphasis on relatives and community networks as resources. Workers receive training and develop the capacity to assist families through a more culturally competent, strengths-based approaches to promoting resiliency within families and utilizing family team meetings. Lucero and colleagues evaluated the cultural fit of an approach for a practice model development for tribal child welfare agencies. Three tribal agencies used business process mapping, or BPM, as a tool to develop culturally based tribal child welfare practice models. BPM is a highly structured and detailed process that involves the staff working collaboratively to define and document each step of their practice from case referral and intake to assessment, service delivery and case resolution with the assistance of an outside facilitator. In summary, tribal agency members considered BPM to be a mainstream intervention but found it to be useful in creating models reflecting child welfare practice in tribal cultural contexts. They also indicated that future adaptation of the BPM for use in tribal settings should help the tribes to better articulate cultural values and norms, as well as differences between tribal and mainstream child welfare approaches. And finally, Chafin and colleagues compared recidivism rates and client satisfaction ratings of a subgroup of 354 Indigenous parents in Oklahoma to the larger sample of parents receiving safe care. Safe care is a highly structured behavioral skills training model delivered as one component of a broader home visiting service. This model has been found to be more effective than home visiting services as usual, including in reducing recidivism of child maltreatment. Six-year recidivism reduction for indigenous subsample was equivalent to the larger sample in overall client satisfaction. Finally, our fifth question explored the challenges to widespread implementation of culturally based programs. Several studies contained empirical data relevant to understanding the challenges to implementing culturally based or culturally adapted county, state, and provincial child welfare services. Clearly, concerns about disparities in the involvement of Indigenous families have been voiced for decades. Likewise, Indigenous scholars and professionals have been describing and implementing culturally appropriate services to Indigenous families for decades. Furthermore, available empirical data suggests that culturally based county and state child welfare services may be effective. There appear, however, to be a variety of obstacles to their widespread implementation, including inadequate allocation of resources to agencies serving high numbers of Indigenous families, and agency level factors that impede culturally sensitive child welfare practices. There is some evidence that state-level factors, specifically the failure to fully comply with the Indian Child Welfare Act, impede culturally sensitive child welfare practices, leading to poor outcomes for Indigenous families. The Indian Child Welfare Act mandated that certain steps be taken by states when intervening with Indigenous families, but the federal government failed to put a formal monitoring system in place. Hence, Compliance has been a problem. Indeed, the limited empirical research of the Indian Child Welfare Act compliance published in peer-reviewed journals reflects somewhat mixed results. Lim and colleagues conducted case re record reviews of 49 ICWA eligible children in out-of-home care and surveyed 78 caseworkers and 16 tribal social workers in the southwest state. State workers reported limited knowledge of many ICWA requirements, but nonetheless, 83% of Indigenous children were placed according to preferences outlined by ICWA. Both state and tribal workers reported a high level of state-tribal cooperation in working with Indigenous families. Although this southwestern state demonstrated relatively good ICWA compliance, the situation nationwide seems decidedly more mixed. Lim and Brown conducted a nationwide content analysis of the ICWA section within Title IV-E 
child and family service plans of 43 states and the District of Columbia, and interviewed 11 children and families administrators and eight state officials. They found that 75% of states had conferred with tribes and tribal organizations in the development of their CFSPs, and most of those that did not were in states without federally recognized tribes. They were, however, particularly concerned with whether or not three minimum ICWA reporting requirements were met by CFSPs. One, indigenous children were identified. Two, tribes were notified. And three, preference was given to indigenous caregivers when determining out of home permanent placements for indigenous children. They found that only 34% of states had plans to identify indigenous children. 27% has specific measures to notify the child's tribe, and 41% demonstrated a preference for indigenous caregivers when determining out-of-home or permanent placements. Perhaps most concerning, 52% of CFSPs did not include any of the three required specific measures. Given the sheer number of articles published in Child Welfare, Relatively little empirical research has focused on Indigenous child welfare. More empirical research is needed to understand the reasons for disparities in the involvement of Indigenous families in child welfare. Also left out of the research were the voices of Indigenous parents and children. In order to understand the child welfare experiences of Indigenous people, it is necessary to implement research methods that are understandable within the cultural contexts of specific Indigenous communities, and methodologies that can convey Indigenous perspectives. In addition, many Indigenous people and communities are protective of their traditional and ceremonial practices and beliefs. In many cases, non-Indigenous research methods are inappropriate to conduct research in these areas. Furthermore, Indigenous people have experienced abuse and misrepresentation at the hands of outside researchers. There is, however, a growing literature on Indigenous epistemology, worldview, and methodologies. Indigenous research methods that stem from Indigenous knowledge create a path for accurate representation and interpretation of the experiences of Indigenous people and communities. The use of such methodologies for understanding child welfare within Indigenous communities is reflected in some recent dissertations. For example, Cameron's 2010 dissertation used methods of inquiry into how experiences with child welfare affected the personal and social identities of Anishinaabe participants. This included the Aboriginal Circle Paradigm. In addition, Nikowe's 2011 dissertation explored Ojibwe parenting and responses to family challenges that included a modified talking circle format. Let's return to the concepts of universalism without uniformity. We see two types of broad implications from our scoping study, those generally applicable to strengthening child welfare for all families and those specific to indigenous families. Child maltreatment is a common and persistent problem across diverse cultural contexts. The focus of our study is Indigenous families, but we would be remiss if we did not point out the value of a cultural perspective for strengthening government-run child welfare systems for all families. Attention to child welfare systems operating in diverse cultural contexts, including Indigenous communities, can help us to identify taken-for-granted beliefs and practices within mainstream systems, and perhaps think differently and more creatively about improving those systems. Indigenous ways draw our attention to the potential of less coercive and more extended family, community, and strength-based approaches broadly relevant to reforming poorly functioning child welfare systems. For example, some non-Indigenous child welfare-involved parents and professionals have criticized the existing U.S. child welfare system as adversarial, punitive, shame-based, under-resourced, and racist. They explained that their experiences within the system 
compounded their challenges, including engaging in potentially beneficial services or practicing in a manner consistent with their professional ethics and personal morals. Making change to this complex county, state, and provincial child welfare systems is clearly daunting, but it is possible. While it is never appropriate to simply transplant cultural practices from one cultural community to another, attention to diverse child welfare systems can stimulate ideas for changing existing, poorly functioning systems. In particular, there are government-run child welfare systems that, similar to indigenous approaches reviewed in this scoping study, are minimally coercive and extended family strengths and community-based. For example, shortly after devolution, Scotland implemented Getting It Right for Every Child, a government program that provided a new child welfare framework that emphasized relationships between local service providers, the immediate community, and vulnerable families and the responsibilities of local communities for caring for all children. Japan offers yet another model where the legal system rarely becomes involved in cases of child maltreatment. Professionals look with long eyes at struggling families. They focus on developing and sustaining relationships with parents who may need support for extended periods of time or in the future and ensuring that children in out-of-home care are well integrated into their communities. Critical study of such diverse cultural cases can stimulate new ways of thinking and approaches to government-run child welfare systems, as well as forecasting some of the potential challenges and strategies for establishing meaningful systems change. The scoped studies we reviewed have specific implications for culturally-based child welfare with Indigenous families. We began this paper by emphasizing the importance of understanding Indigenous child welfare with historical contexts. To conclude, we have come to view current disparities in the involvement of Indigenous families in child welfare as a manifestation of a long emergency, that is, the sustained depletion of social and environmental resources resulting from centuries of colonial oppression and government-sponsored genocide of Indigenous people. In contrast to a single disaster where relief can be expected from outside sources, in the long emergency solutions must draw upon and strengthen the healthy, functioning systems that remain strong within these affected communities. In the case of child welfare with Indigenous families, our scoping study suggests that a promising path forward is for county, state, and provincial child welfare professionals to look to Indigenous child welfare beliefs and practices for models of culturally appropriate policies and practices. Some promising initial research in Colorado and Iowa is consistent with the practices advocated for and employed by Indigenous leaders. It suggests that partnerships between government-run child welfare agencies and tribal agencies or communities can reduce disparities in the involvement of Indigenous families in county, state, and provincial child welfare systems through culturally based interventions that consider the child is embedded within an extended family and community, are strengths based and community focused. At the same time, the scoped studies also suggest that there are a number of interrelated systems level challenges to the widespread scaled up implementation of such programs. Challenges that must be addressed include the inadequate allocation of resources to child welfare systems providing services to Indigenous families, agency level characteristics such as large size and inflexibility in service provision, and state level factors especially the failure to comply with ICWA mandates. Applying the concept of the long emergency within the context of the seven generations philosophy to Indigenous communities underscores the complex, mutually dependent relationships between child welfare reform and cultural revitalization. Child welfare practice centered around indigenous cultures and resources within tribes is one of the cornerstones for reclaiming and maintaining thriving, sustainable indigenous nations that have been decimated by genocide, stolen and exploited lands, abrogation of treaties, displacement, boarding schools, assimilation, annihilation of languages, federal policies, and poverty.
At the same time, children need well-functioning families and communities to thrive and continue indigenous nations into the next seven generations and beyond. Simply put, child welfare reform is necessary for reclaiming and maintaining healthy indigenous communities and cultural revitalization is necessary to successful child welfare reform. The solutions to disparities pursued in the scope studies are based primarily on supports to county, state, and provincial child welfare systems. A notable gap in the literature is the systematic examination of the capacity building needs at the tribal or indigenous community level and how addressing such needs can strengthen indigenous families. I would like to thank you for joining me for module two. Wai Wanin, have a nice day.